Hello and welcome to a new webcast from the Belt and Road Institute in Sweden. My name is Hussein Askari. Today is Tuesday, March the 12th. Uh, on Sunday, uh, a very important event in China uh, concluded the two sessions, which is the meeting of the two highest uh, consultative and legislative institutions in China, where deliberations by representatives of many parts of China, many institutions in China, deliberate and discuss both what has been achieved in the past year, but also what is expected to be this, to be achieved in the coming year, but also China's long-term uh, policies. Uh, Premier Li Qiang, as I mentioned in a previous briefing, uh, made a number of important uh, statements about China's growth. Of course, it's, uh, he mentioned the fact that the China's economy grew by 5.2% in 2023. It's expected to grow as much this year, but also what he emphasized is China's long-term economic development policies, which are very, very long-term, not something which we are used to uh, here, and which is also the focus, should be the focus of uh, the discussions of both China's economy, but also China's economy in relationship to the world economy. Uh, today, we have a very special guest uh, uh, from China, one of the leading economists, uh, Professor uh, Ding Yi Fan, uh, uh, thank you very much for uh, coming with us. I think you are the best one to ask about these developments because you are specialized in development uh, policies. Uh, Professor Ding Yi Fan is uh, the former deputy director of the Institute of World Development under the State Council, which is a very important cons consultative. Uh, institute, a think tank, which is directly under the highest level of Chinese government, which uh, advises and uh, presents studies on Chinese and international uh, studies, which is very important uh, for decision making in China. But he's currently fellow, uh, senior fellow of the Global Governance and Development Institute in Renmin University, also is a professor in the Beijing Foreign Studies University, but also uh, Dr. Yu have also a very long history of teaching uh, French. Uh, also, you worked in France many, many years. You lived in Europe, also in the United States, so I, you are not a stranger to the European environment. So I really appreciate that you took the time to discuss uh, these matters with us today. I'm the officially retired from the Development Research Center of the State Council. The Development Research Center of the State Council is Chinese government think tank. So our role was supposed to provide some food for thought to our leaders. So every time Chinese government is poised to carry out some public policies, we are consulted by our leaders. So we are supposed to provide them some reflections on the consequences, both social and economic consequences of these reform policies uh, in, in Chinese society. And we also provide the Chinese leaders with some analysis about global economies, the evolution in those regional and international relations, those big events that could affect uh, a global economy. So that will have a tremendous impact on Chinese development. That was our role. But nowadays I'm retired. I came back to university. I, uh, I'm teaching at uh, Beijing Foreign Studies University. I'm doing some research for the Global Governance and Development Institute at Renmin University. Uh, I'm also giving some lectures to uh, foreign students and especially to foreign business people who come to China and, and, and especially attending some seminars uh, provided by Chinese Ministry of Commerce. So that's my background. I graduated from Chinese uh, Beijing Foreign Studies University. I pursued my studies in France. I got my PhD in political science from Bordeaux University. And then I spent some years in, in France. I studied uh, in France. I worked as a journalist uh, in Paris. I spent a lot of years uh, there. Uh, I also spent some years uh, in, in the United States especially in Washington, D.C., I was invited by SES, School of Advanced International mm -hmm. Studies, as a visiting professor. 
So I know a little, little bit uh, the, the academic circle, both in France and in the United States. So Very well. Background. Yeah, they're important because you are not a stranger to European and American uh, politics. So this is uh, very important. So you have the best of two worlds. You combine the knowledge of you have. Uh, I, of course, we will discuss the very, very important book uh, you recently published on new development dynamics and the crisis of globalization, which I had the great pleasure of reading and learning a lot from the profound uh, knowledge and information contained there, which I recommend to everyone. But we will come back to that. I just first want to ask you about what was discussed in the two sessions, but also this whole discussion in the Western media think tanks about China's economy, not only slowing down with 5% GDP growth, but it's collapsing. So what do you, how is your response to this uh, kind of claims? Oh, yes, because we heard uh, all these voices about China's collapsing uh, since the beginning of the century. Don't forget the first book about the coming collapse of China, date back to uh, 2000, uh, 2001. So uh, for quite a long time. So oh, you can hear those kind of voices, the kind of rumors about Chinese economy collapsing. So we know that we, are, uh, we get familiar with those kind of rumors. Uh, the way that we consider Chinese economy growth uh, that uh, since the financial crisis of 2008, China's contribution to global growth is increasing. But China's growth pace is slowing down because of environment, because of international environment. Because since the beginning of the 21st century, since 2001 to 2011, 2012, China got an exceptionally fast growth. China's GDP growth during this period was, in average, about 10%. The highest growth rate was in 2007. In 2007, China got a GDP growth rate about 13%. It's never seen any country, any period. Yeah. Because of this, China benefited in this regard from the globalization, because don't forget that from 2000 to 20, to just after the, the, the European sovereign debt crisis in 2010, during those periods of time, is called the golden age of globalization. So during the golden age of globalization, China took advantage of the liberalization of the global market to sell to everyone. So China became the biggest exporter to every country in the world, especially European Union and United States became China's biggest exporting market. So China's export growth has drawn China's growth, China's GDP growth for almost the first decade of the 21st century. But after the financial crisis, after 2008, especially after 2010, because you know, in the international market, the order has been made previously, several years ahead. So that's why China didn't feel the cool or the cooling wind of deglobalization from 2008. But after 2010, after 2011, we really felt the cooling wind coming from the Western world. And that's why we predicted that China's growth uh, or China's fast growth is over. We were coming into a new phase of growth. Chinese leaders decided to call this new shape of GDP growth new normal. We called it the new normal. Yeah, that, that's all one thing I want. Fast growth. Yeah, this is one thing I want to mention because it's actually a bit shocking to see that it's not the real estate crisis in 2020, uh, 21, uh, which is the source of China's economic slowdown. It's not the stock markets. It's not the foreign direct investment slowing down. It, one shocking thing in your book in chapter one is that, as you say, already in 2010, 2011, 
your government and you uh, researchers, you anticipated, you expected a slowdown. Yes. And uh, you say in your book, uh, it's like a new development strategy named New Normal, acknowledged that China's economy has come into a new period of growth characterized by a moderate growth mm -hmm. uh, ratio, but also better quality growth. Now, yes. here where people don't miss the issue, first of all, you anticipated that there will be slower growth, but also, uh, I think, especially President Xi Jinping since 2012, when he, he became the general secretary of the CPC, he was focusing on this idea of moving from this high quantity, low end uh, export uh, economy to high quality uh, economic growth. And in the two sessions, we actually had uh, also, interestingly, a new term being used. It's called new quality productive forces. Uh, so this is something which is not just come, uh, you know, in the last two years. This is something we have been studying for. Yes. Years. So uh, this, how do you see this shift from the, the low, uh, high quantity to high quality uh, economic growth? How did that uh, start and where it is going? So it started by the change happened in the global market. Uh, so China, uh, well, Chinese government anticipated the change that happened uh, or that will be happening in Chinese economy. So we planned the slowing down of Chinese economy from above 10% and we planned to bring down the, growth, the GDP growth pace to 8%, 7%, 6% gradually. So Chinese uh, economy growth uh, slowered uh, during 10 years from 10 to 6%, I would say, to 6%, because 5% was not the expected rate of growth. We expected growth to be maintained at least for two to three years at 6%. But unfortunately, the pandemic happened. The yeah, pandemic this is one important thing. I'm sorry to interrupt you because people say, oh, it, it's the Chinese policy making which is wrong. It's the Chinese market that something is wrong with the Chinese market, the Chinese real estate, the Chinese policies. But nobody looks at the enormous shifts in the global economy starting in the financial crisis in 2008, the pandemic mm -hmm. in 2020, the Ukraine war, which has enormous impact on global inflation and global yes. crisis. Mm. And all these things are ignored and focused <laughs> yes. on Chinese real estate market. But uh, it's partially true because we, to some extent, we underestimated the consequences uh, of the pandemic. So we think that after the pandemic, rationally, there might be a rebound of Chinese economy. So people will start reinvesting. But we underestimate the consequences of the pandemic because after pandemic, a lot of enterprises, especially small and medium enterprises, uh, are seriously affected. Their, they, their balance sheet has been seriously affected by the crisis. So after the crisis, some enterprises, our, our financial institutions, asks those uh, small and medium enterprises uh, to deleverage. You know, you mean to reduce their exposure to indebtment or to 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 indebtedness to all these people. While those people those enterprises suffered a lot. So they cannot afford to pay back those debt. So that's why that that triggered a lot of uh, a small uh, bankruptcy of these uh, small medium enterprises. That's why nowadays a uh, Chinese government decided to provide more liquidity to those small and medium sized enterprises to help them cross over a period of uh, difficulties. So nowadays, those even those small and medium enterprises are coming back gradually. So I hope that in 2024, we will have a better economic performance than last year, than 2023. That will happen. 
we are witnessing a return of these uh, small and medium enterprises because many of them are, we call it unicorn companies, because those companies, despite their size, are technologically advanced. They control mm -hmm. some very sophisticated technology. The only way is to provide them some liquidity to allow them to de continue developing their new technology, then to find new market, to new implicate applications to to try to realize uh, their technology uh, innovations in the market. That's why we call President Xi Jinping, as well as Chinese uh, government leaders, are talking about uh, the new quality productive forces. New quality productive forces because we are witnessing the emergence of a lot of small and medium-sized uh, technology companies. They are developing very sophisticated technology in terms of raw materials, in terms of uh, application uh, uh, mechanics, uh, many, many of them. Yeah. Uh, they are trying to uh, implement new technology of intelligent, uh, artificial intelligence into production process. And that improved a lot uh, the so-called uh, mm -hmm. industrial revolt. Yeah. Uh, th th this is a very, very important area which people really need to understand where is China going with the new technologies, not only uh, information technology or AI, we have, because China is the world's largest industrial economy, manufacturing yes. sector, engineering, uh, space technology, nuclear power, all these things people don't pay attention to. There's a lot of focus, of course, and China is leading in that, like new energy, electric vehicles, but there yes. are sectors in China you take up in your book, which are very, very important, which we would like to discuss uh, uh, because that's important for the world economy. One question which we will come back to in the question of the this lower growth uh, rate and uh, China's readjustment, some people in the developing countries might be worried that this uh, slower growth might mean China will reduce its investments in developing countries, especially with the Belt and Road uh, Initiative. The first 10 years, we saw a, a large number of large infrastructure projects, industrial projects, uh -huh. and people are worried. We will come back to that because you have some interesting things to, to mention on China's financial policy later. Uh -huh. uh, but uh, there is, in this transformation uh, uh, from a low-end uh, export uh, you know cheap goods yes, export yes. E economy those to low end and manufacturing goods yeah uh, that was only to, served to export yes yeah but moving nowadays. to this higher higher quality economic you china will have to go through a certain structural transformation which is normal in these things you also mentioned the fact that china needs to get out of this what is called the middle income trap yes uh, so do we are we going to see like unemployment rising in the low end uh, export industry, like in the garment industry, textile industries, that there will be more unemployment there? Uh, and because many other countries are taking over that we are, we are in, in Southeast Asia, the ASEAN countries, Bangladesh and Ethiopia, uh -huh. even you have textile industries by Chinese companies. The Chinese are now exporting the textile industry machinery instead of textiles, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> which is interesting. But what is the government going to do? Because the Premier Li Chiang said there will be no stimulus packages just to solve this very short-term problem. Uh, so th that we shows have to keep thinking about Premier the long Li, term. Premier Li Chiang talked about no stimulus package because he's confident enough that Chinese economy don't need a stimulus package to pump up its uh, industrial capacity. Uh, we 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 want we don't want to push forward this uh, enlargement of the industrial capacity. We want to uh, upgrade the industrial production chain and then uh, to provide it more value added technology products. Because in industrial supply chain, well, uh, the the higher you uh, upgrade to the level. 
and the the more values, the more profits you can get from your uh, investment. So that's why Chinese government to overcome the the middle income trap, you have to continuously upgrade your production in order to have more added value to your production, and then you you can upgrade your production. We started by making textiles, by making a uh, garment industry. We provided a lot of jeans, a lot of sh uh, shoes, toys. So they, we started by this, and then we uh, upgraded to produce uh, uh, electronic devices, uh, PC, uh, and cell phone, uh, and then we upgraded again to provide more industrial equipment. China has become the biggest manufacturer of the industrial equipment nowadays. Uh, if you look at Chinese export, uh, Chinese exports have crossed over uh, uh, a variation of these products. It started by providing those cheap, uh, low-end manufacturing goods. Then it provided nowadays, it provides uh, electric vehicles, uh, solar panels, uh, and, and batteries, and a lot of many other uh, equipments. Uh, China's export, China's biggest export items are nowadays ele uh, electric equipment, electronic uh, equipment, uh, those uh, big machineries, uh, as well as these uh, electric vehicles and uh, renewable energy production equipment. So that's a big change linked to Chinese economy uh, development, but also that's a big change happens in Chinese export structure. So that's how China moved from a low end manufacturing economy towards a, a more and more sophisticated uh, manufacturing economy nowadays. Yes. So, but the question is what will happen to the people who are dealing with the low end uh, industries, uh, what will happen to the... According to the rules of international division of labor, so China is uh, redistributing all these production to neighboring countries, to Africa, for example. In many African countries, China helped those countries build a lot of industrial parks. Yeah. In Ethiopia, in Kenya, in Tanzania, in, in, in all these countries, we have built a lot of tens of industrial parks. Yeah. Well, Chinese firms invested in those industrial zones, bringing uh, a lot of international orders. Of, yeah. Of and I know my from my own uh, from my own knowledge, uh, like in Saudi Arabia, China is building enormous industrial uh, zones, uh, like yes. for petrochemicals uh, and yes. other uh, uh, mm. new energy parks in Egypt. Uh, there is a very large uh, industrial park at the yes. Suez Canal. Uh, mm -hmm. So this is this is the new uh, way of China doing things. Instead of exporting lots of goods, it's exporting the production capacity uh, yes. and relocating these industries in other areas. But uh, so, I mean, China is also corner take you know cornering a lot of other sectors. We will discuss that. For example. China has the largest is the largest manufacturer of, of port cranes. Which yes. So about uh, there's a Chinese company which has about eighty percent of the global market of cranes for port for container container yes. uh, uh, oh. management uh, and port uh, like high speed rail railway equipment uh, mm -hmm. subway uh, train systems and equipment all these things are not visible really. I mean people see the electric vehicles. But they mm -hmm. don't see all this machinery. The the tunneling equipment China is producing now is the world, you know, leader. Uh, so yes, th yes. these are things which are very interesting. You take up in your book. Um, uh, we have, for example, in the uh, in chapter two, you go through very fascinating uh, description of made in China. What that what it means. Uh, yes. And also, there's you have a you focus on a revolution in China's equipment manufacturing sector, which just we just mentioned, mm -hmm. uh, it, the which is like for example Germany has been known for that, yes. but now China is 
becoming the world's largest equipment manufacturing big machines, which are yes. very important to use. You mentioned, for example, China's aircraft carrier, which is uh -huh. a, a factory which can produce such big steel structures, which yes. are as big as a basketball court. For example, yes. the container of a nuclear reactor, it's one piece of steel, mm -hmm. but that factory can produce something that large. So this is a, so uh, can you uh, take us through this process of why is this so important for China, but also for, for the world economy? Uh, I should trick back to the, the previous period for development. Chinese leaders, since the first generation leaders, since Mao, Zhou Enlai, and so on. So those leaders decided to industrial China. And China's industrialization started by introducing those heavy industries. Those heavy industries, so those equipment industries started very, very early in China, although that was involved a heavy investment. That's why the ordinary Chinese living standard in 1960s, in his 70s was very low. People feel very poor because we have to spend money in investing in those heavy machines, in those, mm. those developments. That's why when we decided to open our market and to welcome foreign investment in China, we can provide them with a solid support of these heavy industries. And then when we started to upgrade our technology to produce new uh, equipments, such as you, you mentioned uh, high-speed uh, trains. High-speed train is a very sophisticated uh, technology process. And hopefully we have improved, of course. We started to produce those machine race and we improved these machine with, with modern technology. So we have those gigantic machines that can produce a very sophisticated pieces, items, uh, for uh, assembly of these locomotives, those uh, vehicles, uh, and those things. For example, Chinese fast uh, fast train, high-speed train, Chinese high-speed train, bullet train, or people told it's a bullet train, mm -hmm. it's very sophisticated because the cover is made by once by a gigantic press. Well, in Japan, they also have very sophisticated technology, but they don't have this gigantic press. They'll have to make two pieces and weld it together. So mm -hmm. when you look how many if they weld it, so it has a lower wind resistance forces, while Chinese locomotives have a strong wind resistance capacity. So mm -hmm. that's how the, your, your gigantic machines can help you produce better quality products. That's 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 the way how we deal with those machineries. And all these started by 2008 financial crisis. Because Chinese leaders projected we could no longer rely on Chinese export drive to, uh, to push up Chinese uh, economic development. So we focus, we shift our focus on Chinese domestic investments, especially Chinese investments in infrastructures. And 10 years later, from 2008 to 2008, it completely changed Chinese picture. In 2008, we developed our high-speed train technology, but we have built only more than 300 kilometers of high-speed train, high-speed rail. And then 10 years later, we have built more than 30,000 kilometers of high-speed belts. And up until last, the end of last year, China have built more than 43,000 kilometers of high-speed well, which represents more than three quarters of high-speed wells in the world. It's By also the, the whole circumference the whole circumference of Earth is about 40,000 kilometers. <laughs> so you have built yeah. a railway, high-speed rail around the whole Earth circumference. Yes. 
Uh, it's very interesting because I, I, I'm i studying the Chinese high-speed rail system evolution and how it started. Of course, you, it, you, you integrated some foreign technology, but then you built your own yes. uh, domestic. We absorbed the foreign technology yes. and then but we, we transformed it. You created something completely new, completely Chinese yes. uh, in that process. Very uh, ironical uh, coincidence that the first Chinese rail, uh, high-speed rail from Beijing to Tianjin was inaugurated in August 2008. That's yes. when the financial crisis broke out in the United States with the Lehman Brothers Bank. It's a very ironic coincidence. But from my study, which I will present soon on the uh, Chinese high-speed rail, I travel a lot with the Chinese high-speed rail, but I also studied the background, is that what you did in China with building this enormous high-speed rail system is not to make only transport of goods, of persons uh, much faster inside the country, connecting the whole country together, but as a side effect, you created the world's largest and best construction system. You have the yes. best construction companies in the world. You have the best tunneling. Uh, I traveled from uh, Zhengzhou to no, Chengdu. No. There are, okay. there are dozens of very long tunnels <laughs> yes, that train yes, passes yes. through. So you have it's a mountainous area. So in the process of developing the high-speed rail, China developed new technologies, advanced technologies in tunneling, bridge building. You have new technology yes, in yes, how yes. to build also these uh, large uh, you know bridge girders, girders, you know, this, this yes. is completely Chinese. Uh, advancement of the construction process. And so these are things which people don't pay attention to is that the Chinese high-speed rail uh, enabled China to become the world leader in all these sectors at the same time with that side effects over the whole economy, mm -hmm. which is of great importance for, uh, for the world economy because people talk about that China has over capacity of construction <laughs> and therefore they are trying to find somewhere to use it. But the reality is the world does need that Chinese capacity because we have a $4 trillion infrastructure deficit in the developing sector of the world. So we do need that Chinese uh, capacity uh, yeah. for our development. Um, I mean, the, in your book, the, you take so many examples, uh, examples on innovation, examples. So it, it's very difficult to encompass everything. So I only encourage people to read your book, but I want to move to the next, um, yes, uh, of, of unless course. you want to say something about this. Uh, the impact yeah, yes, of I can add something because yeah. we uh, we get aware that uh, developing uh, high-speed rail sectors will involve the participation of a lot of sectors into these new uh, sectors of construction. And because an experience comes historical from Germany, in Germany also, after Germ Germans uh, reunification or, or, or the creation of Germany German Empire in 1871, they started building their railway system. The construction of railway system in Germany have contributed to the creation of so many industrial sectors that that's become a trigger of everything in Germany. So in China, in the same, almost to the, to some extent, the development of high-speed trail, high-speed rails have created also many, many opportunities, as you said, for different sectors, uh, shared machine or tunnel shared machine. So that's you, you, how can you can make so many tunnels? Without the construction of this shield machine, we cannot build all these tunnels, those subways. Also because of we have developed the technology of these shield machines. Since 2006, we started developing our own technology of the shield machine. From that period, we imported shield machine from Germany, from Japan that was extremely, extremely expensive. The way they, they provided with those shield machines is 
not appropriate because the machine made in Germany or made in Japan cannot meet Chinese spatial or geographic conditions. We have to adapt those machines to our geographic conditions, but you need to invite those engineers to come to China to adjust their machine to the working field. It's extremely costly because you know to recruit an engineer, you have to pay the same cost than to recruit a lawyer. You know, a lawyer, how, how expensive is the lawyer? Well, the engineers is as expensive as a lawyer. So we cannot afford to continue to buy those machines and to implement into Chinese works. So we decided to, to make it happen in China. So uh, we started building these shield machines. Nowadays, China is the biggest uh, producer of this shield machine. China's made shield machine represent more than 70% of the global market. Right. Not only we use those shield machines to build, to continue to build highways, high-speed rails, to build uh, those uh, uh, subways, because look at uh, in recent years, in recent years, in every Chinese big cities, we are building a subway system. And in, last, in, in something like 10 to 15 years, China's subway system is leading in the world. Last year, someone made a statistic about the subways, the importance of subways. Guess what? Among the 10 top subways in the world, Nine are in China, in Chinese different cities. Right. So the those famous underground system in London, in 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 New York, in Paris, they are out of this top ten list. Yeah. So that's how it makes so many so quick progress in building those subways because we have built this gigantic machine, shield yeah. machine. You can afford to build up those uh, subway systems. Yeah, and we have here in Stockholm right now uh, one of the new subway uh, lines is being uh, the tunneling is being done by a Chinese company because they were considered oh. the most efficient and most uh, cost effective and uh, actually even environmentally uh, friendly uh, construction sites. So this is a a, a big plus for China. It's a great success because you invested in your country. You build your tunnel systems, your subways, your train systems, but now you are sharing that knowledge and also uh, get it, benefiting from it uh, economically mm -hmm. from uh, this. So these are very important economic factors uh, which people uh, often ignore. They think about export or about the <laughs> you know numbers, money. Uh, as, and consumer goods, but they forget these very important things, which are for the livelihood of the of whole societies. Like a subway system is very important for that, millions. That, of that's people. that's the question you mentioned. China is turning from a high speed growth to a high quality growth. The high quality growth can send all these projects. We're improving infrastructures in China, so that facilitate people's life. That change completely pe Chinese people's livelihood. They change their living mode. So nowadays, traveling in China to city to city is very easy. They like in the same city. I I fly to Shenzhen. I come back. I fly to Shanghai. I come back. I take the the, the high speed train to go to everywhere in the north part of China. It's mm. like in Beijing in the old days. Yeah. Uh, that's very important. Uh, let's uh, move to the uh, other question on financial matters. Uh, because in chapter three, you deal with uh, the question of the financial system, uh, but you take up two very important questions that everybody's talking about. Uh, for example, the inter internationalization of the Chinese currency, the RMB. Yes. Uh, and how that will do affect the process of de-dollarization. Now mm -hmm. we have the emergence of the BRICS countries. We have members of the BRICS countries, especially Russia, uh, 
are eager to discuss a question to replace the dollar system with a BRICS currency system. Uh, the second question you take up is what to do with the enormous uh, foreign currency reserves China has, you know, like about $3 trillion, what to do with that? Uh, uh, mm -hmm. And uh, so the first question is on the internationalization of the RMB. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you see this process uh, going on? What is China's position? Because my understanding is that China is not eager to, uh, it, it, you know, in, internationalize its currency the way the dollar has been done, because you want to keep control of your currency and how uh, it's... Yeah, see, uh, China didn't realize that international currency is so important. Actually, uh, in 2008, the question of Chinese currency internationalization had been raised and mentioned, first of all, by British people. Those British high rank officials, I, I don't want to mention their name, but those very high ranked official governments went to me. They said that, does China have the plan to make its currency internalized? Uh, and London will welcome the off try Chinese currency market. So I, I, I said, Frankly, the Chinese government didn't, doesn't think about the issue of internalization of this currency. We, we didn't care so much about internalization of this currency. But after the financial crisis, there is a need, you mean? There is a need because the US dollar is no longer a reliable currency. And then, in the reform of the international financial and monetary system, people are talking about Chinese yuan or Chinese yuan's position in the world. That's why uh, Chinese yuan has been included by IMF as part of the uh, drawing, uh, special drawing right, SDR, special drawing rights. So China's currency is becoming an official reserve currency in IMF. So as such, many countries, or in many countries, central bank have to keep some Chinese yuan's assets as the composition of their foreign currency reserve. So that's how Chinese currency becomes more and more internationalized. And, but in recent years, as the United States started wiping knife the US dollars as an instrument to, to trap over the adversaries. So uh, the de-dollarization has been appealed by more and more countries that have troubles with the United States. So they don't want the US to continue to play the predominant role in the current international system. For one yeah, I mean, we have, have the coercive measures, avoid. sanctions. Yeah. Yes, all kind of sanctions, and, and even after Ukrainian war. So uh, the United States decided to, to freeze uh, the Russian central bank's assets. And then they even threatened to confiscate the, those uh, assets and, and to reduce them. That it happened also with Afghans. Uh, central bank, they f decided to freeze uh, uh, central bank of Afghanistan, and then they redistributed those U.S. dollars asset to so-called Afghan refugees. So it's completely insane. insane. It's completely illegal because you can those so-called other country central banks assets in US dollars, it's their assets. If you can mobilize, you can freeze, and you can confiscate other countries' financial assets, it's completely, it's a robbery. That's why many, many countries are talking about de-dollarization. They are decided, they have decided uh, to keep some distance with the dollars. That's why the need 
for Yuan internationalization has become an urgent issue in international relations. So it happened last year, for, for, for example, BRICS countries, so Russia, India, Brazil, China, and South Africa, they have a lot of business to do together. While previously, their own business was settled by Euro or by US dollars. As nowadays, the deal with US dollars or Euro becomes very dangerous. So last year, when India decided to buy a large amount of coal from Russia, so they decided to settle their deal by Chinese Yuan because uh, Rubia or, or Robo is not that uh, stable. Mm. So they decided to use a, a third currency, so Chinese Yuan, mm -hmm. to settle their, their, their deal. And it happened also between Brazil and Russia. Brazil decided to buy a, a large quantity of uh, fertilizers from Russia. But as Brazil could not pay by euro or dollars, so they decided to settle their, their, their deal by Chinese yuan. So mm -hmm. that's why how Chinese currency is used by more and more people in, in international deals. That's why Chinese currency becomes internalized, not because of Chinese effort, but because uh, of faute de mieux, because other countries cannot mm -hmm. do better than that. So they decided to use Chinese currency as an instrument, as an intermediary to solve their problem. Yeah. So the, the role is is more to uh, facilitate trade and, uh, you know, to yes. avoid all these other coercive measures by the United States and the West with sanctions. But the, as you everybody knows, the dollar is not only used in trade, it's also a reserve currency. It's used uh -huh. in all kinds as an asset. People keep it as an asset. Is China worried that the, the, the yuan uh, will be also become something outside of the control of the Chinese central bank and government. Uh, so you are but not- Those kind of concerns also happened uh, at the beginning in, in the United States. When Europe created the offshore dollar market in the 1950s, the United States were very concerned. They said, what will be the role of this offshore dollar market on our domestic market. So they went to London. They went to, uh, to the city. They wanted to know the consequences of the days. And then returning to Washington, DC. So those experts explained to American presidents that the creation of an offshore market cannot really affect the price level, because it's it, 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 their main concern is about inflation, because a lot of money was accumulated outside uh, the United States. They are very concerned about the impact of this liquidity in the inflation uh, level of the United States. <laughs> and then they realized that the money circulating out of the United States cannot affect the price level of the United States. So we got this experience. We know that those offshore markets cannot affect Chinese level. And as Chinese currency is very stable, look at Chinese CPI. For quite a long time, Chinese CPI is very stable. It's under 2%. So very stable. Even Chinese economy have a lot of concerns about the deflation because the the inflation the CPI level is so low, it's so stable. So uh, that makes Chinese yuan stable also because the yuan's purchasing power is stable as the CPI is very low, stable. So in the long run, Chinese currency will become a well appreciated currency such as Deutsche Mark. Remember that in the 1970s. In the 1970s, there is also a period uh, in global economy where inflation is the biggest concern. 
because the US dollar devaluated a lot after the collapse of the Bretton Woods system. The US dollar devaluated a lot. The devaluation of US dollars caused a lot of inflation in the United States itself. Then the US inflation will have some uh, spiral effect over Europe. So European countries passively got a lot of impact, negative impact from the dollar devaluation and inflation. So, uh, and then they wanted to keep uh, their currency packed to US dollar. Because of this inflation effect, they decided to keep, uh, to, to keep some distance with the US dollars. And they decided to pack to Deutsche Mark because at that time, West Germany's price is the most stable. And then when they decide to pack their currency to the Deutsche Mark, they seem to import some anti-inflationist factor from Deutsche Mark. So all those European community countries decide to pack their currency to Deutsche Mark. Mm -hmm. And then that, that makes the basis for the European monetary system. Oh, yeah. in, within the European monetary system, the Deutsche Mark is the currency of reference because every country's currency were packed to uh, Deutsche Mark. I think that in the future, the Chinese yuan could play this role of anchor currency. Because if you look at uh, current inflation rate, CPI level in the United States or in Eurozone, it's much higher. It's much higher than in China. So, and if you look at the indebted level of the federal government in the United States, in Washington, DC, so it's that GDP ratio is above 130. In Eurozone, it's almost 100, it's 90 something percent. It's almost 100 percent of the GDP. While in China, it's only 30 yeah. percent. So China has no motivation to devaluate its currency. While in the United States and in Eurozone, my maybe one day or another, they will find some reason to devaluate the currency, to deflate their debt in real terms. Because one common uh, Reinhardt and Ken Rogoff wrote the, the, the book, the, the, the 8th century of financial 40. So this time is different, 8th century of financial 40. They explain that historically, all European countries use the depreciation of the currency to deflate the real debt. So yeah, so they they can escape paying the debt. At yes, the can they escape these <laughs> things? People suspect the United States will do something similar, and uh, because the yes, US, the yes. debt, debt service levels are unsustainable. I mean, they have to pay around yes, one trillion yes. dollars every year of the budget. It becomes so dangerous. Yeah. But that's it's important that you know, we have the Chinese, you have the BRICS countries, that there's that, a, an why, alternative. That's why, likely or unlikely, Chinese currency become an alternative choices. Yeah. Because we, we, Chinese... we, we didn't really think about Chinese currency's internalization. But alternatively, people think that they want to take some distance with US dollars or with Euro. So, and they think that Chinese currency could be another choice. Yeah. Well, if we go to the second part of your arguments in the, the chapter three on the financial system, you deal with the question of uh, what to do with China's enormous uh, foreign currency reserves. Now you encourage two things. Uh, first, that uh, on the one hand, that uh, in developed countries, China should increase its uh, investments uh, or Chinese companies should increase their investments, mm -hmm. especially to have access to high technology, uh, although that's being restricted now by the European Union yes. and, the, and the United States. 
-hmm. The other option uh, you encourage is in developing countries um, that China should increase its investment of those reserves uh, mm -hmm. to secure the return on investment. Uh, but how does that apply to investments in the BRI? As I mentioned earlier in our discussion is that there are many countries in the developing countries. We saw this uh, discussion during the third uh, Belt and Road Forum, which we attended in Beijing in October last year, that mm -hmm. people were talking about, I mean, not Chinese, but foreign others, yes. say that China is going to reduce its investments in the BRI because of the financial crisis, the economic slowdown, and that it, China will only focus on small is beautiful things uh, here and there, uh, you know, things that help communities, like what the EU has been doing in Africa, for example, small, small, small projects which have no real economic effect. Mm -hmm. uh, so th th there is a, how do you see the importance of China investing in specifically the developing countries on the BRI? Oh, actually, I think that Chinese investment in Belt and Road countries continue. And if you assess the inv the result of these investments in BRI countries is very encouraging because it has paid a lot of, uh, in many of these BRI countries, Chinese investments in infrastructures help those economies get a better performance in their global development. That improved people's livelihoods, that improved the, the conditions of uh, economic development. And so these countries attracted more and more foreign investment, direct investment, because along with the improvement of your infrastructures, you are conditioned to welcome uh, foreign investments in manufacturing sectors uh, get better. So more and more foreign companies would like to invest in a, a better environment. So all this happens in many countries. Uh, but after 10 years of investment, we Chinese uh, get more cautious about that. Uh, we won't invest uh, as massively as in the past because the demand is slowing down. So, you know, as in China, uh, if Chinese government uh, doesn't want to increase its investment in infrastructures, like in 2008, it's because there is no such a space of investment in infrastructures. There is not so much space for these investments. While in 2008, there is a lot of space of investment. Same in those Bermuda Road countries. So we have invested during 10 years in building these infrastructures. Uh, so we cannot afford to continue to pour in investment in those in same infrastructures. So we have to have a better selection of projects. We will continue to improve the infrastructure, but we have to make a better selection to be ensured that these projects will be sure to succeed in the future, to add more value to local economy. Because the purpose of investing in infrastructure construction is to help local economy get to an upper stage. So if we are sure that our investment in those sectors could make those local economy better, and then we will continue to invest in those sectors. But yeah. we have to make a, a, a more careful uh, assessment of these uh, investments. So uh, for these purposes, and then also because previously we made some decisions that are not so uh, rational that are not so rational. So that didn't reach uh, the expectation we made to the economy. That's why we, we, we become more cautious. We said that if we will invest, we will be sure that the, the, the result of the investment will be very beneficial to the local economy. Yeah, this is a very important point, which uh, many people, I mean, especially the so-called observers and the Western media, that they really don't 
understand they have forgotten what is the purpose of infrastructure because you don't uh -huh. make money you uh -huh. don't make money from building infrastructure what you do with infrastructure is you increase the productivity of the society yes. mm -hmm. if you have better transport if you have enough electricity clean water and skilled labor then that leads to an increase in the economic activity of society and in industries and in agriculture and in the service yes. sector because without infrastructure you cannot do that and this is the responsibility of every government, but China has actually taken the initiative to help those countries build infrastructure, which is yes. in monetary terms are not beneficial for China. Mm -hmm. Of course, they are beneficial for Chinese companies who can build these things and export mm -hmm. their machinery. But mm -hmm. the, for, if we take Africa, for example, the, the, the deficit in infrastructure is so enormous that we will need to work for a decade or two uh, mm -hmm more intensively than have been done just to fill the gap in what these societies, I mean, Africa is 1.3 billion people now. Yes. Uh, They're projected to become almost 3 billion people by 2050. Oh. So Africa is a very promising, but we, you need, I mean, President Xi Jinping in 2015 and the Johannesburg Africa China summit, he said there are three bottlenecks of development that Africa need to overcome to uh, modernize, industrialize. Mm -hmm. And that is the lack of capital, lack mm -hmm. of infrastructure, and lack of skilled labor. He said, yes. if you fill these three gaps, these bottlenecks, Africa's economy will grow like we did in China. But yes. China alone cannot solve all these problems. There are 50 countries and these, you know, as big, it's, it's three times larger than China's yes. inside mm -hmm. and has as many people as in China. So China cannot develop all of Africa, but the model China has presented in Africa through the Belt and Road is succeeding and is actually very popular despite all the propaganda about debt trap uh, mm -hmm. and all these things. I think the Chinese loans to many countries are very too nice sometimes. <laughs> I, I looked at some of these contracts, for example, with Montenegro to build a highway, very, very difficult yes. project. It's only 2% uh, interest rate compared mm -hmm. to commercial rates of four to five percent, and it has it's a twenty year period long. Yes, term, a long term long, and has six years of grace period where Montenegro didn't have to pay anything. So mm -hmm. these are China is actually. I mean, I can understand people in China are a bit <laughs> because a Chinese company would not get such a very good <laughs> deal <laughs> to get a loan inside China, but uh, other countries are getting good deals. So. This is very important, but my point is that we need not only China, but all advanced economies, they need to support the yes. infrastructure development in Africa and other parts of Asia. Because that's, that's why China initiated the creation of two completely uh, newly created uh, financial institutions, uh, the British Countries Development Bank yeah. and uh, AIB. Asia is a attractive investment bank. Right. Those two important development banks uh, serve to provide more funding for those infrastructure works. So uh, those development banks, the role of development bank is to provide long-term low interest rates for those uh, infrastructure works. Yeah. So and China, China's development bank. It's also a huge bank. Uh, there is a book uh, describing the role of uh, China's development as a super bank in the world. Mm -hmm. Because actually, the asset of Chinese development bank is bigger than World Bank. It's a huge capital. So China use its development bank, first of all, to finance Chinese own development. And then nowadays, China's Development Bank is reaching out to, to many, many Belt and Road countries, providing them with key funding for those uh, needed infrastructure works. And though mm. those works can serve the country, can completely improve the country's development conditions, and then providing them with basic infrastructures that could trigger other investments. So that created a virtual circle of development. Yeah. So.
very important. Uh, well, we there's another issue you take up in the in the third the chapter on the financial matters because we have now two lies circulating is that uh, foreign companies uh, like American companies are disinvesting. They are leaving uh -huh. the Chinese uh, market. Uh -huh. uh, they, they don't mention the fact that, that the U.S. government is forcing those companies yes. to, leave, to leave the Chinese market. That's one thing. Uh, the other thing is that they say the Chinese government has big restrictions on foreign uh, companies to invest in China. It's the fault of the Chinese government. They don't. They are not so liberal in allowing uh, foreign companies to invest in China. Now there is a fallacy here, because as you, you, uh, Premier Li Qiang, he actually said in the report mm -hmm. to the two sessions um, uh, mm -hmm. last week, he said we have lifted all restrictions yes. on companies who want to invest in manufacturing in China. Yes. So if you want to invest in something productive, you are welcome. Yes. But the restrictions, as you mentioned in your book, and also warn against allowing hot money, people who are out, you know, mm -hmm. uh, venture capitalists who want to <laughs> go quickly into China, uh, flood the financial markets, the real estate market, create bubbles and make profit and leave the country. I think this is, uh, the, people don't differentiate between these two. So why do you allow the first, which is investment in manufacturing, but don't allow the second, which is investments in the financial and other uh, sectors? I think you mentioned a very key point in China's opening to the outside world. Since the beginning, China decided to open its market to welcome the foreign direct investments. So since the beginning, China has welcomed many, many foreign direct investments. Uh, but China allowed a few portfolio investments to come into China, very few. These call is QF, qualified institutional foreign investors. Those qualified institutional foreign investors allowed to come into Chinese capital market, to invest into Chinese market, but with a limited city. So they can come into China if they want to invest into Chinese market, but with a limited amount of money. You, you don't allow to invest in China massively with all your money. No, you can only come into China with some limited amount of, uh, of, of liquidity to invest into these markets. We wanted to take advantage of these institutional investors to improve Chinese uh, port portfolio investment. Because in Chinese capital market, some Chinese companies are listed there also. They want to raise funds from the market and, and so, but we don't have any experience. So those qualified foreign institutional investors could provide some experience by their investment in China. They can show to Chinese investors an example of how to manage those assets. So, but we don't want to open the whole capital market because China, China doesn't lack capital. That's something very specific. China is the biggest saving country in the world. Even China used to be a poor country. Chinese inhabitants have the got the customers of saving some money in prevention of the uncertainty of the future. That's Chinese traditions, Chinese, this deeply rooted in Chinese culture. This Confucianist. Confucianist told people that you have to manage your individual, your family assets, not to borrow too many money. You have to save money to manage, uh, to keep the balance of your spending and your, your, your revenue. So that's why Chinese people get in customs to these kind of cultural uh, inhabitants. So 
China doesn't lack capital. While in many developing countries, they lack capital. That's why they should keep their capital market open to foreign investors, even if they know that though most of these capitals are speculative capitals, but they still have to introduce them to their market. But that's a big risk. That's a big risk. So what China is doing is try to replace the lack of capital in those countries by providing them long-term investments in infrastructures. So they have to manage the short-term investment, speculative investment, and long-term investment need. That's why from time to time, those development countries get into financial crises mm -hmm. because they have to borrow in short terms money from those rich, wealthy countries then to finance the investment in long terms. Mm -hmm. Well, this mismatch of this mismanagement uh, were not well controlled. It will lead to a financial crisis. Mm -hmm. So what China is doing is to prevent these kind of things happening uh, and to, to provide those developing countries with long-term investment funding, then they will not need some short portfolio investment to keep the balance. And then <coughs> their financial market could be kept more in stability because they won't need so many short-term speculative capital into the market. Right. There's a, the, one of the things which I discovered from the studying the cases of so-called Chinese debt trap countries like Sri Lanka, Zambia, Pakistan, I looked at their books, the central mm -hmm. bank. The crisis is not because of Chinese loans. The no. crisis was mostly because of euro bonds, short-term, high uh -huh. interest rate. And in Zambia, Zambia borrowed like five-year uh, euro bonds for nine percent interest rate oh so so these countries are in a race to get to borrow money from the bond markets from american and european bond market to pay all mm. that they they don't even invest in infrastructure industry they mm. they borrow money to pay all debt and mm. that keeps piling up and then you have crises like uh, the pandemic you have other uh, collapse mm. of commodity markets collapse of tourism in sri lanka uh, because of terrorism, it, you know, their income is, was shrinking. So they were borrowing money, not mm. from China. They were borrowing money from the euro bond market and private. Uh, and, private and, and eventually they cannot control you the can't, interest rate of these euro yeah. or dollar because the, the interest rate of euro or dollar is controlled by uh, Federal Reserve or uh, yes. the ECB. So this is one of the things we, uh, we you realize, I mean, the, actually, uh, I mean, uh, Jeffrey Sachs recently said that African countries should borrow 10 times more to invest in infrastructure, but these loans should be very long term, yes. 20, 30 years <laughs> loans, because the benefit of infrastructure comes, you know, later. Yes. Does, you don't make uh, benefits, financial benefits from infrastructure, like in five years or 10 years. And, if you mm. educate the child, you can't ask them after five years in school to pay back to society. They have to finish the school. They have to go to school mm. 20 years yes. to be able to pay back to society the investment which was made in their education. And mm. this is one of the things people don't understand, the difference between long term. Uh, we have taken a very long time now because the material you provide in your book is so thorough. I, mm. We will just finish with one bridging question because the first four five chapters of your book deal mm -hmm. with purely economic matters also very much related to chinese economy but then you in the um, uh fifth chapter you already move into political discourse yes, on yes. how china's economic power will project you know it says China's economic power is growing enormously, but how will that be projected as political power? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> should China's neighbors and its partners fear this, this factor of China using its new economic might 
to pressure them politically and strategically to make concessions to China. This is the big discussion in the West. Oh, uh, which I understand. I, I think that culturally speaking, they don't have to be concerned by the rise of Chinese political power because a Korean scholar, the American Korean scholar have wrote a book about the history in East Asia. And he tried to tell people that even China was much powerful than Western powers. Because <clears throat> if you read the book of Angus Madison, a permanent uh, uh, British economist, and he said that for more than nine centuries, for more than 900 years, China used to be number one in the world, the powerful country in the world. And China wanted to make the peace and stability in East Asia. China never abused its power in East Asia to try to make some pressure <laughs> to those countries. China will try historically every time there is a disequilibrium in Asia or well, in East Asia. China is there to redress the justice. Because every time in, in, in this East Asia, Japan is a rebellion country, is a rebellion nation. He always wanted to make some trouble in these areas. Every time Japan will disrupt the order to invade Korea, to invade all this China, China will try to redress the justice to chase away Japanese, to reach it. China never thought of conquer the neighboring countries. No, in the, not the case of Chinese culture. But China the... will use this power, economic power, to, to, allure, to allure neighboring countries to abide by Chinese uh, order, somehow Chinese order. Chinese order is, is a fairness with everyone, with especially with small countries. If you visit China in, in Hebei province and in Shandong province, you have still some tombs of these uh, southeastern countries uh, king, kings and, and princes because they were affected by the disease and, and the, the dead in China, they have buried there. And then because in the old days, all these peoples wanted to come to China to try to build a friendly relationship with China because China will ensure them with a, a, a lot of abundance. So this system is wrongly called tribunal system. It's, it's, and as if those small countries were somehow repressed by China. But in reality, Chinese emperor will give back much more gifts than they can offer to China because China is a big country, it's huge, it's abundance of wealth. So Chinese emperors will give back much more gifts to those small countries. That's why the closer you have relations with China, you have more access to this tribunal system. Korean, for example, Korea had the better relations with China. So Korean are allowed to participate into this so-called tributary system twice a year. They came to, to China twice, bringing their product. It's called of, it's a sort of, official trade. It's a sort of official trade. So they bring to Chinese emperors their, their gifts, their products. So Chinese emperors will give back much more to those Korean representatives. So two times every year, they get much more mm. things from China. And then because Japan have so many, makes so many travels in the East Asia, so they are allowed to make this tributary system 
only once every three years. <laughs> you get to China every three years only. So right. you mean you can understand why the system is maintained such a way. So you mean that the Chinese culture itself is prohibitive to this kind of manipulation of power to suppress others and but to China, suppress others. China today instead is... China wanted to provide some incentives. Yeah. Provide some advantage mm. to those incentives and those advantage could encourage those countries to behave in such a way that is incompatible with stability and peace in the region. Yeah, I think China's modern uh, view of things, I mean, the, China, like it, through the, the global uh, security initiative, uh, it is arguing that we should adhere to the United Nations Charter. This yes, is not yes. a Chinese invention. It's no, not no. the Chinese centers, no, no, uh, no. but we need to have a more, more order in the world than a new world order. The new world order, I mean, we can discuss this, hopefully we'll have a, a time for another interview to discuss, everybody's talking about the new world order where China and the BRICS are playing a central role, but China's policy today is, is not that we have to reshape, create a new world order, but to maintain order in the world through adhering to the United Nations charter principles, the sovereignty and independence of nation, but also there's certain security, you know, undivided security. Uh, That's why Chinese president just uh, came out with a, a proposal about the global security initiative that yes. every country should take other countries' security into account. Exactly, that some, some countries or group of countries' security is not more important uh, than others, that every country's yes. security should be taken into consideration. But also I think it's very, very interesting, very specially Chinese is that China says there is no security without economic development. Yes, yes, because it's you... dialectic. The, 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 the question between security and development is dialectic. You cannot ensure your security without development and you cannot have your development without a safe environment, so security. Exactly. And I think this is a very important aspect of what China is calling for uh, as a in the world uh, order to have more both security, but also peace and uh, economic uh, prosperity for nations. I think this is people don't really understand what is meant by a community of shared future for mankind. Uh, it, it has it's a very profound uh, idea. Uh, yes. which includes these aspects we discussed today. But I, I thank you very much. We've taken a lot of your time today. Mm -hmm. uh, very fascinating discussion, but I hope we can continue in a new interview on uh, these other matters which you address in your book. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you very much. And uh, invitation. you're welcome. It's a great pleasure for us to have your insights and uh, knowledge shared with our audience. Thank you very much, and uh, we'll see you in the See you future. next time. <laughs> see you next time. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.